All right, how's everybody doing? Everybody good? Excited to get started? We're about to go. We're about to go. Okay, fantastic. How are we doing? Everybody excited? Yeah. Can I get a hell yeah? Hell? All right, let's do this. Let's do this. Okay, so um, let me pull this up. That's for you. I have a few announcements to make and then we'll get straight into it. So uh, the first announcement is that I know this stuff is really tough. Um, and I know that we haven't got enough time in these sessions to uh, dive into everything we want to, to get to know each other, to um, be able to help debug and that kind of things. So um, we've organized some what we call focus groups over the next, uh, well, the next few days, and we'll do that every weekend. And if they're popular, maybe we'll do it more. If they're unpopular, um, maybe we'll do them less. So tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday as a trial, we'll do at least an hour of um, time to just come and pack together. Um, we'll default to this location if we need to go somewhere else in the world. That'll be from uh, 4.30 to 5.30. So if you need help, you want to debug, you want to um, just come and be a part of the community and contribute, that'll be the place to do it. So hopefully that's uh, really helpful to everybody. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Extra stuff for all of you. Okay, so I just need to figure out the stream. There's 10 things going on at once. All right, nice. So that's looking good. It's looking good. All right, view slideshow. Okay, cool. So, um, welcome back to the ChatGPT lectures, and I'm Harry Berg. Um, today, this is where we're at. Just to again. Uh, signpost where we are. So we're on programming for deep learning part three. Today we're going to talk about neural networks. This is the intro to deep learning, and we should get a lot of hands-on time with it. And later you will get um, a turn to build. One thing I want to shout out at the start is giveaway prizes. Like I said, today's the first day we're going to do it. It's a Thursday. It's the last day of the week, and um, and I really want to build up the energy and keep you guys all engaged. So we've got some epic stuff to give away. Shall I tell them, or shall I tell them what it is uh, at the end? Now we're going to announce it at the end. But I want to build up some more excitement. Okay, so we'll, we'll let you know what the prizes are in the middle. But now, you can just get a head start if you are excited. And at the end, one of you is going to win two things. Two things today. Two very exciting prizes. Um, so all you need to do to be a part of that is, like I said before, um, post about how epic this is, about what the lecture is like, about what the experience is like, about what you're building. You're here building the future. It's the very first time it's happening. Very few people get this opportunity to be with such a great group of people and, um, and learn and work on it together. Tag me, tag AI Core, and uh, make sure you're in Discord. Yes. And then we're good to go for the giveaway. So intermission, I'll announce what it is. End of the day, we will um, announce, uh, we'll pick a favorite and winner for today. Another thing before we get into uh, what we've got planned today is um, a lot of people have been asking me about what AI Core is, so I just want to give a very quick demo of that and give you and let you guys know what we're doing when we're not here delivering lectures on uh, ChatGPT. So AI Core, what do we do? We train people to be AI engineers so they can build the future essentially taking people through a sequence of projects so they can get hands-on experience doing the things they would do in industry. Of course, a lot of that comes with the content, the kind of stuff that you've seen for the pathways we're looking at. But the most important thing is the projects. And so an overview of those you can see up here, um, there's a bunch of projects. Um, it varies depending on which path you take, but essentially you get, uh, you do some basic projects to get warmed up you go through a computer vision project to get hands-on with AI and programming that. 
you work on a project which is focused on cloud and software engineering to really build up your skills in, uh, in GitHub, cloud, AWS, all that kind of good stuff, Docker. And then you choose a specialization. So um, a bit of uh, insight into what the industry looks like right now, it seems like there are really four key pillars of AI and data. Those are data analytics, data engineering, data science, and machine learning engineering. And so they're the four specializations which you can choose to go through. And uh, there's a number of projects for each of them, which are all based on real industry systems that we've talked with the engineers who built them and figured out what that looked like step by step building it. So for example, the one I've got here assigned to me as my active project is Facebook Marketplace's recommendation ranking system on Facebook Marketplace. They got to recommend you products. They got to do it in the right order. There's a very complicated system behind that. And it uses machine learning to figure out um, what should be recommended in what order. Excuse me whilst I skip through this extremely long spotlight. And then we'll get to an overview of what that looks like. There is no skip because it's my first time on this demo account. And once we're there, you can see this. It's an outline of all of the milestones of the project. So each of these contain tasks and you do those tasks by going through that at the end of this day, you will have built this system from end to end. So uh, each of the tasks contains, um, contains different tasks and in each of them, you will also have some prerequisites possibly. So if I skip through these tasks here and get to one that has some prerequisites, you can see here, there's a number of videos to go through. There I am. And the idea is that as you would in industry, as is the job, you learn in the flow of work. It's not like the whole course is just learn, 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 and at the end there's a big capstone. It's you've really got to get hands on with a project like you would if you were in industry. And then you have to learn on the job, which is really the job itself, is being able to learn what you need when you need it. So there's prerequisites intertwined with those tasks. Now, before we move on, um, the thing for me is just to reduce the gap as much as possible between what you practice and what you need to do in industry. And one of the biggest differences between most people when they practice and what you do in industry is that when you're in industry, you don't start from scratch. If you join a company, they're not going to say, here's, here's, an empty, here's an empty GitHub repo. They're going to say, there's a database running, there's code running in it, and there's this huge like cloud infrastructure, and you need to jump into that, which is why we developed a system which allows you to hit this button, set up a cloud environment, in this case, an AWS environment, and jump into an existing uh, pre-populated cloud environment, which will already have the database running, the database there, sorry, the database running, the data there, um, containers running code, et cetera. And that means you get a much more realistic experience without having to waste your time doing uh, either a toy project or doing a lot of setup, which wouldn't be the job if you were really um, joining the company for the first time. So um, I can talk more about that later, but a lot of people were asking me about it. And um, so I just wanted to highlight what we do. Um, other thing is at any point, hit this button, get live support, jump into a call with one of our support engineers. So any questions about that, feel free to ask me later. But we're here for a different purpose today. We are here to, as you saw, learn about neural networks. So um, I'll give you guys a second just to open up the portal and open up the programming for deep learning pathway. Today, we're on this notebook, which is called Understanding Neural Networks. Okay, cool. So this is what it should look like for you guys. Um, again, um, I'm just up here to draw your focus to certain points. There's a lot more details in the notebooks. So you should be reading through those and making sure um, you get all of that great detail. But today we're going to go through neural networks. So the motivation is, remember that graph I showed you yesterday where you see trivial problems can be fit by straight lines. The input and the output, they have a very simple relationship between the two. 
But for most real-world problems, the input-output relationship is very complicated, not something that can be modeled by a straight-line equation. So what we want to do is we want to introduce much more complex models, models that can represent you know, crazy input-output functions in very high-dimensional space. Now, you could come up with your own idea of a model which you know, takes a lot of inputs, it applies this function, which I think is going to be really good. This one my, my friend told me is going to be really good. But that will really be putting a lot of bias into the system and assuming that this is the best way to fit it. And so instead, you can use these models known as neural networks, which allow, which allow the system to be able to find whatever function it, it, it needs to within all the space of possible functions. So essentially, neural networks, what they do is they apply not just one single transformation, but they apply maybe many transformations, a little bit, little bit by time, to gradually make the data, um, gradually transform the data into, their, into the output prediction. And the hope is that by, instead of just applying one simple transformation, you can apply many, and that can represent a much more complicated input output function. And that's what we see today. So this is the first diagram I'll show you, which represents the simplest possible neural network you could have, where instead of the linear regression trying to make one transformation all at once, that's it by straight line, would be a more complicated function. What a neural network does is it applies multiple transformations, very simple transformations, as we see. And the hope is that that represents something more complicated, it represents a more complicated input-output relationship. And that middle value there, each of these nodes represents values, remember? The middle one there, we call that the hidden layer. It's not the input, which we see, it's not the output, which we get out, but it's some intermediate values which appear in the middle of the model. And it's got A in there because we call the values that appear in the hidden layer the activations. So we'll see in a second that what happens when you pass data through a neural network is that the model tries to build hierarchically more complex relationships by combining the features in the previous layer. So in this first hidden layer, you have a combination of the inputs from the layer before. You combine them in a certain way that hopefully represents something that's a little bit more useful, a little bit further towards the prediction that you want to make. And then you can take those hopefully a little bit more useful representations and combine them through another transformation into your final prediction. And you might do this not just one time, but many times. So if I scroll to the next diagram, you can see down here um, where I've represented each of those variables showing each of the elements. And um, you can see here on the left-hand side, the linear regression model we looked at yesterday, that has a number of input features, in this case, three input features, and a single scalar output. The way that it works, very simple, there's an associated weight parameter on each of those arcs, which corresponds to the feature. You multiply each weight by its feature, and then you add them up, and that's your prediction. That's the linear model, the straight line function. And this is what a neural network looks like. So you can see it's some, there's something similar about it. Right? So for each of these activations, you've got that weighted combination of the inputs. You've got arcs going from each of the features to each of the activations. And all of these activations make up a vector, which is your, um, which is the numbers in your, in your hidden layer. So the hidden layer, in this case, just one hidden layer, arbitrary how deep it is or how wide it is, as we'll see in a second. But in this case, you can see that the, each of the value in the hidden layer represents some combination of features. Hopefully, we will learn the right parameters such that these things in the middle become useful features. The model should learn to find what's useful in the inputs and combine that in here so that it can then be used to maybe make, make a prediction directly. So in that case, yeah, I've got two transformations. You know, apply one on the inputs, take it to the four layer, four, uh, four four vector in the middle, which is the activations, and then another transformation after that to make the prediction. And these neural networks, they have parameters just like our linear models. So here I've tried to highlight that. You can see I've got two different sets of parameters now. That's because I don't just have one 
set of weights uh, which are weighting the features and then combining them to a single output, I've got many combinations of them. So this output layer here, which takes the hidden to the prediction, that looks similar to what we saw yesterday. It's got a weight for each of the inputs. The weight corresponds to kind of how important is each of those features, how much does it influence the output of the changes. And on the input, on the input layer, plus plus layer, you can say, I've got um, I've got a lot more box. So these ones, I've not just got a single output, I've got a vector output. And so I have a weight matrix instead of a weight vector, where the rows correspond to which input I'm talking about, and the columns correspond to which output that um, that, I'm, that I'm predicting. So you can see here I've got color code the arcs in each position. So each of these weights in this weight matrix has an index, and that is the index of um, that's the index of which example does it sorry which uh, input feature does it get mul multiplied by, and then the second index, which is which output feature does it contribute to. And again, all these values are just the features weighted by the corresponding weight, and then summed up over here, and then added bias. Okay, so add that constant. We have that wx plus b for each of these activations. And uh, in this case, just note that the bias will be a vector, not a scale. So you have one bias for each of these outputs. So that's a different plus, plus constant on the end of each of those linear equations. Very simple neural network there. The size is arbitrary. And that is the next thing that I want to show is just that you could have more than one hidden layer. You could have many hidden layers, one after another, and they all work in exactly the same way. And you could also have different widths of these hidden layers. You could have a, a much wider, much shallower. They could all be different. It could all be the same. And uh, through that, you can create any kind of architecture that you want. Now, on that point, not only the hidden layers can be different sizes, but so can the inputs and the outputs as the same in the neural regression. So you can have any number of inputs and also any number of outputs. And so that makes this a very flexible model. You can you can choose you know however many inputs you can take, however many outputs, and you can easily add or take away hidden layers. The idea again is that more transformations should allow us to represent more complicated functions. So generally, um, deeper models can deeper models have a higher capacity to represent more a wider range of functions. Okay, Josh, am I doing good? Any questions? Cool. Raymond, how you doing? Nice. All right, Dahlia, you always got something to add? Anything? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Good <laughs> yeah, keep it coming. Let's go. All right. Um, so just to highlight that point, you know, and uh, just a range here and examples of different models. They, they took me really long to make each of these diagrams, so I didn't want to do any more than that. Um, but the point is you can have any combination of number of inputs, number of outputs, number of hidden layers, depth of hidden layers, width of hidden layers, etc. Just to be clear about my terminology again there, or maybe this is the next thing I mention. Um, no, it's not. The net, the, just to be clear about my terminology there, I'm talking about width, I'm talking about how wide is it this way, I'm also talking about depth, I'm talking about how many layers are. Um, the, so this here is a one, two, three layer hidden neural network. There's three transformations going on there. From the inputs to the first activation in the first hidden layer, from the first activations in the hidden first hidden layer, to the second activations in the second hidden layer, and from those to the prediction. So depth and width. All right. Um, so there are a few more details that we haven't covered yet, but I think this is an appropriate time to introduce some of the code. So what would that look like in PyTorch? We saw PyTorch yesterday, and this should look somewhat familiar. We've got a class up here, defines a neural network, inherits from torch and dot module, which does a bunch of useful stuff. Define the initializer, initialize the parent class, and then in here, you've got the definition of all the transformations. Now, a lot more transformation in this one, right? So yesterday, we only had one. I think it was defined a single linear layer. In this, in this one, we've got yeah, three different linear layers here. So we have four all the way there. And um, we've also got this activation function we're going to talk about in a second. But basically, here we're defining the building blocks, which we're going to use to apply the transformation 
when we apply it. And then the forward method actually implements that transformation. So the forward method takes in some input X and it transforms it by passing it through those layers until it returns an output. In this case, it's a bit long here. So, um, you, but what you can see is that I've got my hidden layer one activations is equal to what comes out of the activation function when it's called on the output of the first hidden layer, which is called on X. So don't look at that for too long because I'm going to show you a much cleaner way to write it in a second. But that would be like the trivial way to write this. Okay, it shows exactly what's happening step by step. A much cleaner way to write it would be like this. So this one introduces a new class here, torture and endos sequential. And what that is, is another, there's another class from torture and end, right? Remember I told you it contains all kind of useful stuff for other building blocks for these transformations. And in its arguments, it simply takes the building blocks, which is going to apply sequentially. So this means one, one nice thing about it is you don't have to know the names for all of your legs. Instead, you just put them in the sequential and this itself, becomes callable. This self dot layers is then callable, and in my forward method here, you can see I just call those sequential layers on my input data. And what I was going to do, in my case, just reading through what's in the sequential, you can see it applies the linear layer, applies the activation function, linear layer, activation, linear activation, and then another uh, linear layer. So before we get on to what's the activation function for, just notice the size of the layers in it. So you can see, I take my number of inputs, and I've got a 256 dimensional first hidden layer, and then I go from 256 to 128 in the second layer, and I save 128 for the next layer, and then I finally combine my 128 activations in my uh, in my final hidden layer into however many outputs I have. And the result of that is that you take your inputs, pass them through all those layers, and then they're the right shape. Question. Um, what is the best way in defining the width set? That's when you're yeah, great question. So um, it's definitely much more of an art than a science, figuring out the network architecture. A rule of thumb is start small and then increase if you notice your model underfitting. Because more layers and more width of layers is um, uh, it, it should increase the capacity of your model. It's but computationally more, expensive. Exactly. Yeah, it's computationally expensive. So there's, there's there's obviously a lot of cost to more computation, which have to happen if you have more layers, and there's many more parameters if you have wider wider layers. Great question. Cool. So the obvious question now would be, what are those activation functions? An activation function is simply any nonlinear function. Nothing too fancy to it. I'll show you why it is in a second. These are some of the common activation functions that you might see. Um, the most important one is the relative in the middle, which is very simple. And the, you know, the whole point of neural networks is keep everything very simple. Don't bias it a lot and let the model figure out the right parameters so that it represents the function that you really care about in the end. And so this linear, so this relative, rec five linear unit, is, is basically a, a straight line. Input equals output, except when the input is less than zero, there is no output. It just gives you a zero. It's, it's very simple. And so this is one thing we can apply as a activation function. It's also very easy to compute because you basically just say, if the input's bigger than zero, give me the input. If it's not, just give me zero. So why do we need that? Hmm. We'll get to that in a second. But firstly, let's look at the whole formulation of the neural network forward pass. Taking in a input x to produce a prediction y hat, that looks like this. And now, hopefully, you can see in its full glory, everything colored, and it's actually not that complicated. It's simply linear combination. So, weight to each input feature by an associated weight. So, yeah, that's right. And so, weight to each feature, add a constant so you can offset it, and then pass that through the activation function, this g here. That g is the ReLU that I'm talking about. Um, it could be could be any other activation function as well, but stick with relative. And then the output of that, which is your first layer activations there, you weight all of those hidden features, and then you add bias again. It's not that complicated. And if you want to have more layers, you just do that again. So it becomes more and more nested. This is a very simple example. You can see all the parameters here. So 
from the input, which has three dimensions, to the uh, first sitting layer, which has four, you've got this three by four matrix that's all the parameters in that layer, and so on throughout. Uh, maybe again, one thing to notice here is um, the bias is a vector. So for this layer, um, you've got four different biases. Yeah, question. Um, so why don't you apply the activation function to the output of y hat? Good question. Why don't you apply the activation function to the output of y hat? Um, it depends on what you're trying to predict. So for example, if you are trying to predict, um, well, depending on what you're trying to predict, you might need to be able to predict values that are less than zero, which the ReLU can't give you. Or let's say you're trying to predict a probability, in which case you want your model to output a number between zero and one. Well, then you should probably apply a different function which puts numbers in that range. So um, we'll get to why you need to apply activation functions at all in just a second. But your output, like, it's just as long as it can represent the range of numbers that you needed to. Great question. Cool. Um, yes. I've got the same question. Awesome. Cool. Same question. So let's take a look at why we need these things. This is my this is my proof. Uh, but basically, if you don't have activation functions, no matter how many layers you add, it doesn't increase the capacity of the model because it reduces back just to a simple straight line equation like this over here, where you've got just one layer of transformations, weighting features, and adding bias. So simply, the neural network equation with the bias is ignored because they can be shown somewhere else. With a full neural network equation without the uh, activation function applied, you basically have these two matrices which get stacked together. If you do the multiplication first, you can come up with just that can be represented just by a different set of numbers. And looks like that ends up like this, just a weight to some of the features. So adding more layers, no matter how deep they are, no matter how many of them there are, if you don't add an activation function, does not add extra capacity to your model. So you won't be able to represent anything more than a linear input output relationship. Okay. We're making great time. That's all the um, that's all the, the theory and the numbers and the maths. Um, questions about that from anybody? All right, let's take a let's take a three minute break. I'm um, around the room and um, get yourself a drink, and then we'll get back to it. All right. <laughs>
Okay, let's get back to it. Let's get back to it. Any questions? Second question on Discord. Yeah. Uh, what's the other types of layers and linear layers? And are linear layers the only one you on? Great question. Great question. So somebody asked on Discord, um, what are the different types of layers other than linear layers? And are any of the uh, any of those layers used in neural networks? In practice. Yeah, cool. So um, that's a good point. So just to note here, like I said, torch.nn contains a bunch of uh, different layers. Uh, it contains all kinds of different transformations, building blocks, which you can have in your neural networks. The linear layer is the simplest layer, which just applies that straight line um, equation. And what you'll see as we look at more and more complex models is that the, the thing that changes really just what's in this sequential a lot of the time. So uh, you may have convolutional layers or like simple image um, processing problems where, where you need to preserve spatial layers. Later we'll look at um, recurrent layers like recurrent neural network layers, LSTM layers uh, for processing sequence data. Um, other kind of layers, I mean, there's all the activation functions inside nn.linear. There are things which can help your model with generalization, like dropout or um, or things that stabilize training, like rationalization, layer normalization, uh, attention. We'll look at later. So paying attention to certain inputs more than others because that might make sense for your problem. Um, there are loads of different types of layers, and if you want to see all of them and look ahead, then what you can do is you can go to uh, torch torch nn and You'll be able to see everything inside Torch.nn right there. So you can see here, in fact, this would be an easy answer to the question. Here's the types of layers. Containers, convolutional layers, pooling layers, padding layers, etc., and uh, loss functions, etc. So, or even transformer layers. There you go. So take a look through this docs. And again, reading this is the key skill. Reading this is the key skill. Sweet. So plenty of layers in there. Lots of fun to be had. All right. Um, any other questions? I uh, want to ask about code layers. We'll move to the next bit. Sweet. Let's do it. So I touched on this earlier, but I think this is a really useful diagram. It's the only one I can't claim to um, slave over. But this one shows how neural networks are supposed to build hierarchical representations of the data. So. On the left hand side, you can see the input layer, which would be, in this case, the raw pixel values of these spaces flattened out into a vector. And those pixel values, they, they just tell you the color of one pixel, and that's it. So there's not much information in that. But what neural networks do, in fact, there's not much information in that. And as you can imagine, it would be very hard to figure out what's the function that combines all of those pixel values and just makes a classification straight away in one transformation. Very hard because that that data is so low level. It's so raw. It doesn't give you any idea of the more complex, abstract representations that are present in the image. So, what neural networks are going to do is to gradually, layer by layer, build their own representations by figuring out how to combine the lowest level features into something slightly more complex. And so, the intuition here, I think, probably the best example, is that. You may combine the pixels into uh, groups of pixels which represent edges. And then you can take that first hidden layer, which has high values where certain edges are present. Maybe this top one represents a short horizontal edge. Maybe this middle one represents a diagonal edge. You can then combine those features in that first activation with, uh, with each other through the second layer. And then the next layer, you end up with not combinations of raw pixels, but combinations of shapes, or sorry, combinations of lines. And those combinations of lines, you can imagine, combine that with that, with that, with that, creates a different shape. And so this second hidden layer, having built on the lines, can represent shapes. And so what you get in this hidden layer is high activations where a certain shape is present, depending on what shape that particular uh, layer has, um, has learned to represent. And so you can see here, these are the kind of things which it might, um, which might cause certain, certain uh, activations in the second hidden layer to activate highly. And then the third hidden layer will be combinations of those shapes. And those combinations of shapes, in this case, might build faces. So neural networks build that hierarchical feature representation, gradually building on each other until they represent things which are just kind of on a spectrum closer to the actual predictions which you want to be able to make. 
Question. Uh, just going back to the front of the Lincoln Party. So in the front of that three parts, some of that um thinking might be written. So the lower third decimal probably the lower third decimal would really take it along with any the preceding layer. Um so is is the point of activation functions to filter out certain features? Um, the point of activation functions is purely to allow the model to represent more complicated input-output relationships. It's only ReLU that um, that actually kind of gives no input uh, if, the, if the input's less than zero. So there may be something useful going on there. I'm not particularly an expert on, on the activation functions, but, um, but other activation functions, for example, like the sigmoid, it's going to let something through whatever the value is. It's just going to have removed that linearity. It's got something to do with how far it changes. It, it, it can also help with the with the gradient, yeah. Because um, so some uh, some this is a good point. I haven't touched on actually. Don't know how we deep we want to get into it or need to get into it. But um, some activation functions can have problems with when the, for example, in the sigmoid or the tan eight, when the input or the uh, sorry, when the input is either very high or very low, they're very flat, and that flat part is basically a zero gradient. When you compute the gradient of each of the model parameters. They get multiplied by zero, and so you can get this um, saturating gradient problem where there's no, there's not enough gradient signal to give the parameters um, enough of a nudge in the right direction. So ReLU can help with that a bit because as long as the input's positive, then it's always going to have a nice strong positive one gradient. If it if it all happens to be negative, um, that might be a problem, but it's much less of a problem. And there are variations of the ReLU which can tackle that as well. Such as the leaky ReLU, which doesn't have a zero output of it, it's a very shallow gradient, so it still has some gradient. So this is your back propagation. That's when we do the back propagation, which I'll talk about in a second. Exactly. Right. Great question. Hello. Um, I just wanted to say that um, for those people who are on Discord, uh, when I first like learned about the neural networks, I like did not understand it. It was like extremely hard for me to comprehend. But then I found this article which I now posted, and it's on Medium, and it basically explains how like. You know, like it's just a function multiplied by a function multiplied by a function multiplied by a function. And that part will really help me, so I don't know, maybe it would be useful to someone to kind of break it down to like a much more mathematical and basic level. Awesome. Yeah, great. Yeah. Anybody find anything good, share it, because I think the best way to learn stuff is just immerse yourself in it. If you can see it from 10 different perspectives, hopefully mine is useful. At least it has your attention, so your mind's on the subject. But yeah, please share all those things. But yeah, neural networks just function all of the function, all the function, all the function. Great. So, what do we want to talk through now? Um, you can imagine different examples where that hierarchy might make sense. But the point is that these neural networks, they gradually build complex, high-level, abstract representations, as you see on the right, from raw, low-level, simple data representations. They build up into something more and more complex. Okay, cool. So we've covered all of that. Um, and now one thing that I want you guys to notice is that neural networks can have lots of parameters, lots more, right? So we saw up here, even this diagram, okay, you know, th this, this, this feature matrix is already looking pretty big. And I can't underestimate how trivial and tiny of a network this is. You know, um, we're talking, uh, like I said, if you've got an input image, then you've got a million in inputs in, in your input layer. Um, many of the, the, the hidden layers might have, you know, in, in, in the order of hundreds of uh, hundreds of dimensions or maybe a thousand. And you might have many, many more layers. And if you've got a layer which goes from 10 activations to 10 activations, well, that's 10 by 10 weights. In the so it gets big fast. So you've got a lot more parameters in these models. And if I run this cell and everything above it, we will be able to count how many parameters are in that network. Our network, as a reminder, it looked like this. It went from, uh, it went from, well, it has 256 dimensional hidden layer in the first case, and then 128, and then 128. And this one, it turns out, has, let me define this.
This one has 50,561 parameters. A lot more parameters than we saw previously. Simple function for you to figure out how that works. What is, what is roughly the computation mean for the number of parameters? Um, and by computational limit, you mean... Like what is, what the computer behind? Uh, it depends on your memory. So, uh, how many can you fit in? Uh, that's a good question. We can figure that out shortly. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what precision they're stored, but uh, but yeah, it'll be a limit on how much how much memory you have in RAM or GPU. Good question. Um, let's figure that out shortly. Cool. So, lots of parameters. Lots of parameters. Because there's lots of um, there's lots of transformations going on, right? All of these transformations going on. Lots of parameters. All of them need a gradient. And again. Right, I cannot, and uh, I cannot understate. This is why PyTorch is so useful because if you didn't have PyTorch, you would have to write those gradients for all those fifty thousand, uh, whatever it was, parameters. Not for each of them, but for each set of them, each weight matrix, each bias. You do need to write them out. So PyTorch will figure all of that out for you when we train this model. Okay, so now we can get onto the training. So this graph looks a lot like the one which I showed you yesterday. Except this one's a lot bigger. But you can see a similar thing happening, right? This is a neural network with how many layers? One, two, three layers. Uh, I'll put this one on. on the left-hand side, you've got this input. We weight each of those inputs, get the activations, pass them through an act, sorry, get the, uh, the inputs, the activation, pass them through an activation function, get the activations, do that two more times, and then that gives us the prediction. The prediction, you then compare with the, lo with the uh, label and calculate the loss in this case. And once you've got that, you want to figure out, okay, well, how does the loss change as I change each of these parameters? That is, you want to know the rate of change of the loss with respect to the parameter. And to do that, you need to multiply all of the gradients together along the chain backward until you reach that parameter which you care about. Multiply them all together, that's the chain rule, that will give you the gradient of the loss with respect to that parameter. Now, why have I got these things highlighted up here? The point is that these terms reappear for each different set of parameters. So when I need, when I need to calculate this one, I need to multiply this by this by this by this. When I need to calculate this one, I need to multiply this by this. In both of those things, this blue parameter shows up. So, and the same is true when I calculate the, uh, the earlier parameters as well, this thing will show up not only in the calculation of the gradient for W2, but also the gradient calculation for W1. So you don't want to recalculate these things which you've already calculated to figure out previous rate. So you can cache them as you're doing it, and that is backpropagation. So backpropagation is the algorithm for doing the backward pass where the intermediate gradients are cached, and that means you don't need to recompute them. Instead, you just use them when they were first calculated. It makes it a lot faster. But these can be trained in exactly the same way as the linear model we looked at, because they are differentiable from end to end. You can calculate the loss, you can calculate all the gradients in between. That gives you an idea of how you should update the parameters. And doing that iteratively, batch by batch, taking a small set of examples one by one, passing through the model, figure out how bad it is for them. That is how you train neural networks, similar to what we looked at yesterday. And here you can see that calculation showing up where the, the, the gradient is, well, terms of the gradient reappear. So as soon as you calculate this, cache it, use it in the next one, and the one after that. Very nice, very efficient. Okay, cool. So there's only two more cells. I'll run through this and then then we can spend an hour programming, and I can do examples as we go through that. So this cell, um, please take a look into it, just out of curiosity for Python, but it's not important as we'll use a different tool for doing it later. This one just creates a dummy data set and a dummy data loader. Someone tell me what the data loader does. It does two important things. I mentioned them yesterday. It batches the examples, exactly, and it shuffles them. Thank you, perfect. Um, so data loader, it's going to group them into small batches of random order. And the data set is just going to be scalar inputs, scalar outputs, I think. Uh, oh no, however many features we asked for. 
So I'll create that data set. And then down here, I've got this training loop, which we're going to do together. I'm going to delete that and then we can go from scratch. Okay. So I want you guys to help me out with this. And then we'll do, I think we'll do a practical together. And then you guys can do some more practicals. So here's a training loop. We looked at this yesterday. This is actually just going to be exactly the same as the one we looked at yesterday, even though we're using a much more complicated model. It's the same steps, but I want to go through it because it's important and uh, make sure you guys remember it. So um, can somebody on this side give me the first step or any step that goes into the training loop inside these two loops? I've got my optimizer. I'm going through the data set a number of times. And now I'm going through each batch in the data set. What goes in there? Someone on this side. We need to split into features and labels, exactly. Yeah, so features, labels is equal to the batch. Batch contains two things. I just unpack them into those two variables. What's the next step, sir? Um, once we, have, calculate the loss. we calculate the loss. How do we calculate the loss? I guess it depends on data yeah, what is the data? I think it's a regression data set. So this is just, yeah, it's a random continuous number. Yeah. Mean squared error. Where do I get the mean squared error from? That is one place I could get it from. So torch.nn.mse. Um, I think it, yeah, MSE loss. Okay, that's one thing I could do. Right, I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to come back to that and we're going to, we're going to, there's something else I need there when I do this. So um, we'll, we'll hold that there for a second. We calculate the loss. What do we calculate the loss from? You can point, you can pick someone on your side to, to take over. Uh, you, need the predictions. you need the predictions. You need them first. Yeah. So where do we get the predictions from? Something like that. Great. Fantastic. And let's look at our model uh, definition again. Bonus question. Wait, we haven't defined how it should behave when we call it on something. Where does that come from? It comes from torchdynon.module, exactly. So under the hood, torchdynon.module has said, hey, I'm going to define a behavior for when you call the model on something. What you should do is you should call the forward method. I'll do an example of what that looks like in a second. I'll be fine. Okay, cool. Um, and now somebody somebody over in the first two rows, um, what else comes in the, in the, in the training group? Nice. How do I do that? Exactly. Why is it lost or backward? Why not like prediction dot backward? Because um, the loss is like the output of the entire chain. And so it's like the first grade of the tree calculated in the batch. Mm -hmm. And then through the chain, you will calculate the loss also on the grades that we bias for. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. If I did prediction dot backward, would the parameters grad attribute be populated? No, because no. Yeah, because it comes the prediction from the feature and the feature requires grad is false. No? Let's look at the graph. Oh. oh sorry, the graph's down there. So if I do this dot backward. It'll keep going until that. It will do, yeah. And so will I or will I not have the dot grad actually populated as a parameters? You will. You will. Who is that? Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. So if we go backward from here, it's going to calculate this gradient, this gradient, this gradient, this gradient, this gradient, and this gradient. Yeah, but, for that but one, not the but not this one. Yes, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um. So so the question is. What is going to be in the dot grad attribute? Is it going to be the right value in there? What do you think? If we start from loss. Yeah, if we start from um, if we start from prediction. Sorry. No. It's not going to be the right value. What What's the value going to be in the dot grad attribute? The gradient of the prediction with respect. Exactly. Yeah. It's going to be the gradient of the prediction with respect to the parameter. So that would be um, that would be a mistake. That would be a bug. Because that's not the thing which you're trying to optimize. You're not trying to minimize the prediction. 
you don't want to move in the direction which reduces that most because it might be that the correct prediction is bigger. Because so, the exactly. The prediction doesn't tell us what's wrong. It is the loss function that tells us how. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. The value of the prediction is, you know, is meaningless without comparing it to the label. So, you need to, the thing which you actually want to minimize is the loss. So, that's what we want to know the gradient of with respect to each of the model parameters. So could you like, just multiply by the uh, DL by DY hat? Could you multiply it by DL by DY hat? If you had that, yep, you could. That would work. Um, it would just be, just, just be extra. Yeah. And manual, yeah. Cool. Um, any other questions? That was solid. Yeah, you guys definitely get it if you, if you understand that. Awesome. So we need to, we do lost up backward. Thank you, Dalia. Perfect. Great work. Um, what else goes in here? Someone, someone from the middle, middle on the right, any suggestions? Josh? We, we've defined the optimizer up here, but yeah, that is something we need to do. Yeah, we need to take a step in the negative gradient direction. Uh, using the optimizer. So how do you do that? You call the method. Like optimizer.step. Like optimizer. Cool. Yes, I like it. More people getting involved. That's right. Optimizer.step. Call it on that. Thank you, Josh. Great stuff. Optimizer.step. Depending on what your optimizer is, it's going to update the parameters based on its own rule. So SGD has an update rule. You could change that for any different optimizer like Adam. Adam has its own rule. You can actually see all of the other um, optimizers there. They all have their own update rules of how they should move the, the, um, the parameters. SGD simply like moves it a small step in the opposite direction. Uh, yeah, so that's exactly what happens there. When we, call, when we call dot step, it applies the update rule. What happens after that? Anything else? Oh, no. Zero grad, exactly. What is zero grad? Like that? I need the optimizer. The optimizer, so zero grad is a method of the optimizer. Um, it sets, you said it sets the gradient back to zero. Yeah, it resets the gradient. Does it reset it back to zero? What's the value of dot grad once you set it? Sorry? It's exactly none. Yeah. It's none. It's not zero. It's none. And none indicates like it's not populated. Because you might actually do the gradient calculation and it is zero. So to differentiate between, okay, if I've got a gradient that's zero, it's flat here, versus I haven't set it yet, zero versus none. Not important. Don't worry about it. But it's good to understand this stuff under the hood. Um, that's what zero grad does. Of which parameters? Which parameters does it do that for? How does the optimizer know which parameters to optimize? Or to zero grad? Yeah, and it requires radical true. Um, so, uh, and that's, uh, so I was actually, I was even going for a simpler thing, which is just like, it's these ones, right? So it's the parameters of the model. And, uh, but you're exactly right. That's a great extension. It will only uh, set the grad and bother resetting the grad, uh, sorry, bother, um, yeah, we'll only set the grad and bother zeroing the grad for those with requires grad equals uh, equals true. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Cool. Question? When you call uh, mean square error models, do you put in the arguments? I, I do. Yeah. So so this one, there, there's something interesting I want to look at. Uh, I, I want to look at there. So should we do that now? Yeah, let's do that now. Okay, right, cool. So this is this is my whole training loop. Great work, guys. Great work. That's it. So those are the steps, key steps that happen during the training loop. Most training loops look the same. Some might do something a little bit more fancy. The model like might look a little different. But uh, overall, that's it. That's the key thing. If you understand that, then you understand the learning in machine learning and deep learning. Fantastic. So you can see here what I'm doing. Create the data set. Create the data loader from that data set. Um, uh, initialize the model and then train the model, okay? So I'm going to try, and as we said, put the um, predictions and the labels into here. And I think we're going to face 
an error. And I want you guys to tell me what the error is. Okay, red line on that line. I get an error. It says, Boolean value of tensor with more than one value is ambiguous. What is that? What is that? Yeah, it's on this line. <coughs> not a helpful error. Well, at least the error message is not helpful. Um, let's look back in the traceback, as is good. Okay, so we can see that the error happens. You can see it happens on line 19, but within line 19, that's just called the train function. It happens inside the inside torch somewhere, torch and then reduction.py. It says if size average and reduce. Right, so trying to compare these two things, size average and reduce. Why are they doing that? I don't know. But, you know, it's trying to, it's basically saying, calculating that Boolean with more than one value is ambiguous. Why is this happening? So the values that it's getting is some of them are false and some of them are true and it can't decide whether the Boolean overall is. It is, yeah, but size average and reduce, they look like different things. That's not what we pass in. I would have thought it'd give them a variable like predictions and labels or targets and features or targets and outputs or something like that. Um, but it's not. It seems like doing something else. Alex. Like, like, it, it might not be the function that we want to call. Yeah, so... so just look at the docs. Go up here. We can always look at the docs. Yes. So let's do that in a second. Um, does anything, anybody notice anything suspicious about this, about this function? It's, well. it's not a function, exactly. It's a class, right? So what do you think the issue is here? Syntax. Syntax issue? Um, sorry? Uh, exactly, yeah. So, so I'm sorry, just to take a step back, for anybody who didn't catch that, this is obviously a class because, I can see that just looking by its name, because because it starts with a capital letter, exactly. In Python, the classes start with a capital letter. So what that means is if I follow a class with round brackets, I'm trying to initialize a class. Now, that's a, that doesn't sound like what I, what I really want to do. I really just want to call a function. So let's look at the docs now. Let's see what comes up. MSC loss, here we go, the capitalized one. This is a class. It says create a criterion that measures the mean squared error. Fantastic, that's what we want. And then it says parameters, interesting. First parameter, size average. Second parameter, reduce. Those look familiar. Those are the things we saw in the error message. Down there. So somebody somebody finishes off for me. So what was the issue here? We were passing parameters to the class set of the function that gets the most. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So I'm passing I'm passing those parameters to uh to this class. It, this is not the function which computes the mean squared error. This is the thing which will return me an instance of the mean squared error module in PyTorch. Much like um, much like up here, sorry to go all the way back, but much like up here, this returned me an instance of the hidden layer, not the output of the hidden layer. It returns me something, this hidden layer one, which is, where is it? It's callable. And when I call that on some data, that's when it actually performs the calculation. That's when it performs the linear transformation. So the same thing is happening down here and this is a very common common error right uh, is that i've initialized this class now this thing returns me something which is callable and when i call that on my data it's going to calculate the mean squared error loss but these parameters here they basically say how do you want to initialize your mean squared error loss so there's two ways to fix this um anybody want to tell me how i would how i would uh how i would go about that alex that, that's a very smooth way to do it, yeah. So I could add I could add that. What's happening there when I do that? Exactly. There I initialize the module, and that thing that I've got highlighted is callable. So when I put brackets on the end of it, I can call it with those two parameters. If I run that, it will probably work. We'll look at some other ways to uh, implement the same thing. Yeah. Um, sweet. It, it didn't print anything because I've got no prints in there, but that seemed to work. This is not very pretty. I don't really like that. Um, how can I do this in two lines? So first create an object with this, exactly. Yep. And then 
like that and then call that i don't need that here i could put that like that something like that so above i initialize my loss function and then i uh and then i call that loss function on there exactly you could use so that's the next thing that'll be even better um before i ask you what, uh, how like why why is hmm, i don't i don't even phrase this question so um is there any point in this in this line really like is the loss function something that i need to create and then have its own internal state stored right it doesn't need to remember anything between different calls No, it doesn't, because every time it just applies the same function, and that function doesn't have any parameters which change that the model need, that that layer needs to keep that that module needs to keep track of. It it just calls, you know, it it just takes in the inputs and just does something with those. There's no internal state that it needs to keep track of. So there's not really much point in this being a class because the point of classes is that they can have their own internal state, which you know, stays between the ports. So instead, I could use the functional implementation. Um, Ahmad, where, where do I get the functional implementation from? Where? Yeah. So I'm going to do import torch.nn.functional. Yeah, as capital F. This is something you'll see very commonly import torch dot functional as f so basically i've just um i've just got this uh i've got this file torch dot functional which contains a bunch of stuff and i've called it f and then i can access everything that's inside that f like this yeah exactly so you can see there are loads of stuff which can happen in pytorch which are functional that is they don't require an internal state they don't need to remember anything which happens inside all of this stuff, including a lot of loss functions. A lot of loss functions are stateless. So in there, there's one called uh, MSE underscore loss like that. And that's the functional implementation of the mean squared error loss. So running this, if I log my loss firstly, This is what I get out, okay? We can see something's happening. I'm getting the loss. It seems to be working. The code is running. Now, every time I print my loss, I don't really want all of this. So if you have a scalar tensor, you can do dot item. And it will just give you the value. So there's the loss as we go forward, okay? Awesome. Um, so that that is the, the training of the of the neural network, well, building the network and training the network from end to end. Um, and that I think is a good amount for you guys to get started with the, with the practicals. And uh, there's this practical here, which is using the MNIST data set. Ah, and it's empty, that's not great. Fantastic. That's <laughs> I don't know why that is. All right, well pull that pull that up. Um see if you can figure that out. Maybe refresh the Um let me get it for you. Hold on stage Okay. Um, who can't access it? Raise your hands. Can't access it. All right. Oh, man, I'm going to send it to you in Discord if you can. Actually, I can just post in Discord, can't I? I want to do that. Thank you. 
All right. All right, nice. Yeah, so I just dropped out that in, in Discord. Uh, and I want you guys to check that out. Have a play around with everything in here and figure out some of the complexities of that. As I see some good problems that are um, exemplary, I will um, I'll pull them up and we'll go through. Thank you. 
Second Thank you. 
Um, it's the layer for to like nodes or the it applies it applies to like so you have an input layer which is all the vector all the inputs the uh, first information layer which is all of those uh, activations um, so but another thing about refer to is the transformation so you can say a linear layer or power layer right yeah that's what I'm thinking so um so here uh, this uh, two layer network you really need to think about as like so we only have like one kind of a transformation between the so young input and the exactly. Yeah, that's it. Um, but you can add more, you know. Um, try it and see, like, see, see what performance it gets to, um, and then try add more layers. See what happens. Okay, I've got a question. Who in here knows that they have a pink to do? Who would like to be the you? In about 40 minutes, one of you is going to win, not just the GPU, but also something far more valuable. <laughs> And all you have to do to enter, you know what you're doing. Not how epic this is, how excited you're going to be, what you're building right now, what you're going to build over the next few weeks. And, uh, get work. To be specific, this is actually a projection now. It's, um, it's a Raspberry Pi with a PPC. It's the kind of thing you might find on, um, small robots. Um, but it can do all the stuff much faster than computers. Um, really cool piece of shit. Sponsored by NVIDIA. Thank you, NVIDIA. Gave me a bunch of shit. Um, Thank you. 
Is that how we do it? What? For images, labels, and training. Uh, yeah. But I'm going to say if I did it for All right, um, I just want to show the MNIST data set for anybody who's not aware of it. I should have, should have clarified this earlier. But um, the MNIST data set is... Well, here's the PyTorch docs. I'm sure it links to... It doesn't link to it here, but... But the MNIST data set looks like... Let's find up an example. Oh, dear. The MNIST data set is a collection of images which all look like this. Each of them, uh, a single one, looks like this. It's a 28 by 28 pixel image, and each of them have a classification, which is an index between zero and uh, nine inclusive. So it's gonna be one of those digits. So what our input to the network needs to look like is all of this flattened into a vector, because the current neural networks that we've looked at so far, they can only deal with vector inputs, not matrix inputs, which this grid would be. And the output's gonna be what? I've got a 10-way classification problem. 10-class, multi-class classification problem. How, what does the output look like? Here's some murmurs. A probability for each number, exactly, yeah. 
That's right. Probability for each number. So it's going to be a 10 vector. And each of those numbers needs to be a probability. How do I get the probability? How do I turn those inputs, sorry, the outputs of my model? We know how to get them as a vector of 10, right? You just have an output layer which has 10. But if that's the output of a linear layer, they can take on any value. So what's the value, sorry, what's, so how do we transform that 10 vector of real numbers into a probability distribution? What was that? Um, not an activation function, because an activation function is just meant to be applied on, uh, applied element-wise. Um, similar though. Do you, would, do you add an extra level or you just sum them all and divide every single by the sum? Uh, we yes. You're missing one thing, but yes. So that's what you do. So you said um, you add a layer which sums them all and uh, divides by the sum. Someone over here said, someone over here said sigmoid. Sigmoid is along the right lines, but sigmoid is only a scalar input to a scalar output. The softmax. There we go. Okay, so, so that's it. So the softmax does what you said, sir. It does add them up and divide by the number, roughly, but it also makes sure they're all positive. So um, yeah, look, look up the equation for it. But basically... That's the function which takes in a vector of real numbers, turns it into a probability distribution over that many classes. So that is what you need to apply on your output layer as part of your forward method. It will be sum to one. Yes. Yeah. Sure the yeah. It exponentiates. Uh, yeah, it does e to the e to the power of each input, um, so they're all positive, and then it divides by the sum of those e to each input. So. You also need the number of inputs. Um, and you also need the number of inputs, right? How could you find the number of inputs to your model? So we know it's got 10 outputs. How do you find the number of inputs? Exactly. 28 by 28, 780 something, isn't it? And, um, and otherwise you could just, uh, you could flatten one of the examples and then pull dot shape on it and it would tell you that. Cool. Great stuff. Make sure to print these examples and like see what they look like. And I'll do that now as a demo. Uh, I, I didn't announce one thing, but what's happening after this? I'm like, we are going out for drinks. We're going out for drinks. So um, be there, be out with us. Because uh, we've done the first week. We've done the whole first week of so it. So we want to celebrate. I know Oxford's going to celebrate live. So we want to see you all there. That's right. Yeah. So be there. Um, by the end of this, you know, you know deep learning. All right. You've at least done it hands on, which is a is a thing, a rare, a, a, a thing that rare few people have done. So you deserve to celebrate. Thank you very much. See you later, man. All right, so this is what one of the features looks like. It's a lot of numbers. And that's because we've applied this transform to it, which turns it to a tensor and normalizes the values. If we remove that transform, this is what comes out when I print the features. It says, 
It's a pill image, a Python image library image of 28 by 28, just by removing the transform that was. And now if I do features, which is this image dot show, uh, it doesn't show up in Colab. Hmm. Display. All right, that's what the example looks like. It's tiny. It's tiny, but there it is. Um, so that's a little example there. I just called this built-in display function, which comes with uh, Colab or Jupyter Notebooks, and it shows you the example. If I print the labels or the label, you can see it's a file. So I can look at the input side plot here, so 28 by 28 pixels, but it looks linear, right? So we just need to put it in the password, whatever that is. That's what it gets us. So we need to transform all the input model into the array. Yeah, so just the input side would be linear errors. Yeah, so it's correct. And so do we add the subtracts in the subtract? Um, yes. Um, and in uh, in the total angle structure, I think we do need to use the class implementation, even though softmax is not one of the ones which is it's uh softmax in common state. I'm sorry, what does the normalization do for this image? Um it uh it centers all the pixel values around the mean and uh gives them a unit standardization. Check it out. Uh, but the point of that is a bunch of reasons, but um, one of them is that, uh, is that the gradient in well, so is that some features can be, in different examples, for example, the house price data set, some features like the, uh, the floor space for house can be on the order of like hundreds or thousands, and the number of bathrooms in other features might be on the order of uh, once and, and so they're, if they're disproportionately sized you can have a, a have a, a so you have something where the larger features have much more influence on the gradient and you don't want that so you want to normalize everything um so that it has the same distribution and so it's on the same order of magnitude cool Uh, yes, so Which maybe this function do we use for multi class? So there are several things you can use. Uh, you can use the hyperseed with precision or the F1 score. I think we use the F1 score because. So you can't use so those are the performance methods, but you can't use them as a loss option because you need to use part of the project. Not even the No. Because it comes with the false uh, loss of rate. Which uh, changes it from false. So you need to use. Yeah, right. Uh, you need to use the across piece. Yeah. Oh. That was the that was the, the loss function mentioned in the of uh of the cross I Um it it expects probability and uh expects the probability of the class expects the probability of the true class and well the way it's implemented is right. it expects the it expects the probability distribution and the index of probability, but it basically says okay. The probability of the correct class should be pushed towards the top. What it does. Uh, check the first number and the uh, uh, log one. Yeah, it's negative log of the correct probability. Yeah, it's negative log of the correct class probability.
Okay, I want to do a quick, uh, a quick demonstration here just to highlight what sequential is and give you a better understanding of uh, how the torch to nn dot module works. So you see this sequential, right? This is another torch to nn dot module. So what does that look like under the hood? It looks something like this. Of course, it's a class. Something like that inside a folder, which is uh, called torch inside a file, which is called um, nn. So it looks like that. And this thing also inherits from torch to nn dot module, which allows it to do things like be called. And inside that class, it basically says, okay, when you initialize me, I want you to pass in like many different transforms, right? Transform, or maybe many, many different modules. So module one, module two, and so on, all the way. In fact, you can pass as many as you want. And a way to write that in Python is to say something like this, star args. So that means this function can take in as many parameters as you want. And they're all stored in this variable args, which is a list. So this is a list of all your parameters, which follow self. Then it'll say self.layers is equal to args. And then it will have its own forward method, much like our methods already have much like our uh, models have. So what happens to that forward method? Any guesses? These args are the layers, which are these initialized classes. Remember, these things are callable. You can call them on some data. So what happens in the forward method? Sorry? So you said we return self.layers of x. Well, this thing's a list. So you can't call a list. So that's not quite going to work. What we want to do, right, is we want to go through this list and then call each of them on our data. So how would I do that? Any suggestions? Sorry, I didn't see you said that. Yeah, yeah. I'll say uh, for layer in self.layers. Call the layer on X and then assign that to X, something like that, and then eventually return X. So that's what's happening inside the inside the torch dot functional. It's just got a bunch of layers. It's going to iterate through them and call them all one by one and then eventually return the final output. Pretty nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll show. I don't really like that approach, so I'll show you a different approach now. Um, but yeah, one thing that wasn't great about our about our implementation down below was that. Printing these values is not very helpful. I can't really see, like, how's that trending? So I want to introduce you to, uh, to, to TensorBoard, which is, uh, is not in here, I don't think. I'll make sure that's added in. But TensorBoard, which I can get from, from torch.utils.tensorboard. Uh, I can import this thing called Summary Writer which allows me to write to this very nice interactive graph. So the way to do this is um, import the summary writer, create an instance of that summary writer, like that. And then when you have a loss, do writer.addScalar. Scalar, uh, give it a name, loss, give it a value, loss.item, and then give it like an X position, which I'll call batch index. I will um, put this logging down there. At the top, I'll set the batch index to zero. Uh, and then and then down here, I'll increment the batch index every time I iterate through one, something like that. So, so this, uh, this stuff here, this is me setting up logging. And then down here, this is me doing the logging. And then if I run that, 
it will log all of that stuff to TensorBoard. And now somehow I need to open up TensorBoard. How do I do that in a notebook? I forget. Uh, so that's how you do it, as you see, just found out. Um, use these magic things to launch TensorBoard, and then it's created this thing, which is supposed to contain my data. It said the log directory is called logs. I think the default is actually not logs, it's uh, runs. So if I run that, we'll see what happens. Here it is. Hey. Here's the here's the loss. Doesn't look great. Uh, I am running on a random data set, and it look it is going down, right? So you toggle this thing, you can see this moving, and um, it is going down in general. That looks good. It gets pretty low, and why is there a particular pattern? I don't think I would explain the repeated pattern. I might explain some funny um, non-convergence. I'm not. Yeah, we're not shuffling the training data. If you look in the in the notebook up here, when we create that dummy data set, there's no shuffling shuffling there, and that's why shuffling the data loader is important. So. What's happening down here, if I'm not mistaken, is when you see the pattern begin to repeat, that's the, that's the start of the epoch. And so what, you, uh, what happens, I believe, is like the model, the model gets, it, it gets, it trains, on the, it trains on the data set as it goes through the batches. And as it gets towards the end of the epoch, it's kind of forgotten a lot about what it learned about the first example in, in, this, in this epoch. And so then when the data when the data loader resets, it gets to the example which it had seen most far away, and it's kind of forgotten that, which is why the loss jumps up again. And then it goes through the um, you know, I guess the same amount of useful information as it looks at each batch in the same order, which is why you get the repeating pattern. Amazing. Uh, yeah, for sure. I'll leave that up there. So this is now connected to the running loss. Thing. Yeah, I think this is... It requires you to know about TensorBoard, but that's only a two-minute lesson. So I'd recommend doing this because it gives you more interactiveness as well. Okay. Which might just be that uh, Sure, I'm just conscious that we're running out of time. Yeah. You can also see when you guys came up with the uh, um, so you have to use zero drag because yeah. every time you do drop upwards, it doesn't overwrite the gradients. It adds it. It can be useful in some cases, but it doesn't overwrite. Um, well, it removes the gradient, but the gradient was only used in the line above dot step. So when we pull dot step, the optimizer looks through all the parameters which is tracking and uses the gradient to update. So then those parameters take on the new value. The parameters have a dot drag, and optimizer dot zero drag sets that 
parameter sets the amplitude to zero. If it doesn't set the parameter to zero, it sets the dot right amplitude to zero. Um, I think we're going to run a little over, guys, but I'll, I'll go through the practical, um, and then uh, and then we'll we'll give our prize and we'll wrap up and have a drink. So uh, I might I might might not be able to debug everything, but I'll run through the basic points here. Um, define the sizes of the train of the test set. You can take the length of the data set. For now, I'll just give it. Is it fifty thousand and ten thousand? Yeah. Cool. So train len test len is equal to that. Um, and use the random split so I can do from torch dot utils dot data use the random split random split of the data this one takes in the data set and this data set in my case and then the train and then the list of the lengths train len and test len so that's my uh, train train set and my test set And then create a training data loader. The way I do that is by using the torch.nn.data loader. Uh, sorry, torch.nn.utils.data.data loader. Pass in my train set like that. I'll say shuffle equals true. Again, don't expect you to know this. Just look it up. But data loader is the thing to use. And uh, batch size is equal to, let's say, 16. Just any power of 2 is a nice one to work with. Do I have the data loader yet? No, that's inconvenient from torch dot utils dot data uh, import data loader oh, no. and then this will be my train loader all right then i'll initialize the model and the optimizer um you guys would know how to do that so i won't bother with that step and then here you would implement all the steps we've seen a bunch before. And where's the model, actually? That's the important part, right? So this is the this is the part which is important, where I would call the super method to get something which has all of the attributes and methods of the parent class, including the initializer. Call that. Define the input, output, and activation. Uh, sorry, the input, activation, and output layers. Uh, I'll do this in torch.nn.sequential. So in here, I'm going to have firstly a linear layer. So it's firstly a linear layer, or actually firstly, one way that you can flatten the data is there's a torch layer for that. So when you flatten that, that's a useful trick, it's going to give you this 784 dimensional input for the next layer. And then I'm going to say, okay, after that, I've got 128 dimensional hidden layer. Followed by that, I'll have a activation function, ReLU. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for shouting. Don't hesitate if that's ever an issue. So I call the, the ReLU, and then I or initialize ReLU. Initialize another linear layer to go from 128 to 10. After that, all I need is the, is the code suggestion to go away, so you can actually see what I'm doing. Torch to NN dot. Uh, softmax and with all of that in place that's it right yeah self.layers so I need to define that as a variable thank you self.layers is equal to torchliner.sequential and then I think we should be able to you know just return self.layers of x um, I might be missing something, uh, but that's that's roughly the point. Um, yeah, you need to specify which dimension it goes along, doesn't it? It takes this parameter dim. Um, it's optional, so I think it's gonna I think it's gonna assume, like I said last week, right? Oh, sorry, yesterday. The the one rule you can remember for PyTorch is the first dimension is the batch dimension. So by default, this softmax is going to softmax over the columns, not over the rows by default. Yeah. 
And, uh, and the same is for all of these, right? Because when you pass in an example to your data set, you pass in a whole batch all at once. So it processes them all in parallel. So this X might be, in my case, where the batch size is 16, this X might be 16 by 784. And it will process each of those rows as a different item in the batch. And they will each go through these transformations. It'll be 28 by 28, and then it'll get flattened. Um, encourage you guys to print, you know, to like cut out some of this and print the shape of what comes out, all that sort of thing. Cool. The only other thing which I think is important to notice, which you'll, you'll need to you need to do is calculate the loss. What loss function do we use for most class classification? Alex, sorry, cross the cross entropy. Exactly. Yeah. So torch dot, uh, or if I've got functional as F, I just do F dot cross entropy, uh, cross entropy loss. I think it is something like that. Take that between the predictions, which in my case is a distribution over all of the classes possible. So that's a 10 vector for each example. So this prediction might actually be batch size by uh, by predict by um by class size. So 16 by 10, and then I pass in a vector of the labels here. So that would be my labels, which I would get from the batch above. And out of this, I get the loss. That's how I would do that. Okay. So that cross entropy loss. That's the first time we've seen we've seen that since uh, talking about the equation on Tuesday. But that's the that's the loss function for most class classification. So F, what is the sum? Torch dot dot functional. So you would do import torch dot dot functional as F. Uh, there is a whole lesson on torch dot dot functional, which you can see here. I'd like you guys to check that out. Um, I'd also like you guys to check out linear models, and you can check out the PyTorch and GPU if you have one. We've just done understanding neural networks and. What might be useful, we'll probably scan over it on on, uh, on Monday, will be custom PyTorch data sets. But that's what we're going to do today. That was understanding neural networks. And this is really the essential part that you need to get to understand how to program for deep learning. Next week, we'll start off with one uh, with one with one session to finish off this part of the series where we'll go through pre-trained models and um, and uh, and what else. And we'll probably look at that custom data sets, custom data sets there, okay? Cool. Um, wow, now we only have to announce the winner of the first giveaway. So if you bear with me for two minutes, we'll figure that out. Um, Pamela, Ahmed, I need, I need you here. To, uh, to scrutinize this. Hang around for a second, guys. Let it build up. Let it build up. Stomp your feet. Let's hear it. And then I'm going to announce the winner. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right okay everybody the time has come thank you thank you all for tagging us this is this is what's at stake this is what's at stake and i think um there is one winner that we've just decided amongst ourselves and that is dahlia we'd like to give you this um Jess and Nano and the and the t-shirt. <laughs> awesome. Keep it coming, guys. Let's do it. I'm really excited for next week. Um, this is the penultimate lesson of the of the programming for deep learning part. And tomorrow we'll be getting start next week we'll begin started with natural language processing and then beyond that and some much more complex models. It's been my pleasure to have you. 
Come again next week as well. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe like that's one